So hello everyone and welcome to MathSoc's open lecture for this year. So we're really excited to present this. Um, I'll just give a bit of background of what the open lecture is. Um, we had our first open lecture last year and it was the idea of the previous president of MathSoc, who was Dan Skinner. And um, it was quite a small event, but it went really well. It was a really good success. And we planned on running another open lecture in sort of March time this year, but obviously um, with everything that went on, we couldn't do that. So we're really excited to present this second instalment of our open lecture series. And without further ado, let's get started. So um, just before we do start with the relevant stuff, I'd just like to show you this slide here. This is from um, Dr. Sinead Lyle, who has asked us to promote the careers event, which is happening next week for math students. So I'm sure you've already seen it, but if you haven't, it's a really great event. It happens every year. And um, obviously we've got some great speakers coming along. And it's really interesting just to sort of see where your math degree can take you. And I believe all of these people are, yeah, they're ex UEA students. So it's great to see where people who were in your position once have obviously gone off to in their careers. Um, so go along to that, that's a great event. And we'll move on to some housekeeping for the open lecture. Um, so I'd request that you please keep your microphones and cameras off just so we don't get any sort of reverb, uh, reverb of sound and sort of distraction from what's going on from the speaker. Um, if you do have any questions on the talk that's being given, um, please save them to the end of the talk unless the speaker says that you can ask during. Um, if you do have a question, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little icon that looks like a person with their hand up. Um, if you can press that and then the speaker will know who's wanting to ask a question and they'll come round to you in turn. Um, so just a quick warning as well, this event is being recorded, including the messages in the chat. Um, in the recording, the messages in the chat will be anonymised, so don't worry about people knowing who said what in the chat. Um, and we hope to upload this later on to our social medias, so keep an eye out for that. Um, so without further ado, let's get started and please enjoy. So we've got uh, Carl Frederick up first. So I'll pass over to him. Uh, okay, hello. You hopefully, hopefully you can hear me at least now. Is that, and maybe even see me. Is that right? Excellent. Okay, good. I think that's overwhelmingly a yes. So I'm gonna see if I can share this my slides. Select the slide and. Hopefully that should be good. Can everyone see these slides now? Well, I think so. One yes is okay. One yes is enough. So great. So I am going to be talking about um, something which is slightly different from uh, normal research mathematics. So because there is well, there's a really big turnout. Thank you, Shay, for organizing this and and really getting this to to work out. It's, it, um, it, it, I think it's going to be great. And um, just to make sure that everyone feels included, I thought that um, I'd talk about something that happened to me, uh, a little story that happened to me quite recently. And that's about the B.B. Newman Spelling Theorem. So any talk titled the B.B. Newman Spelling Theorem would be very bad if it didn't start with saying what the B.B. Newman Spelling Theorem is. Uh, and so I'm going to start with that. And hopefully the slide has been changed. That looks like it has been. So. Um, this is it's an, a result called the Spelling Theorem. And it's one of the most fundamental results in an area called combinatorial group theory. Now, um, I'm going to present the result. Here's the result, and it's from 1968. Now, if you stare at that from, for a while, um, you, I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting uh, most, uh, well, anyone really to understand the statement of it. But if you did group theory, last year with um, with Bob and I, you still won't be able to understand it because we didn't cover any of that material in that course. But it's about group theory and about an advanced type of combinatorial group, uh, of a group theory called combinatorial group theory. Um, but to make sure that we're not reading too much into what, what the content of the spelling theorem is, I've decided to, to scramble it up a little bit. So there's some theorem called the B.B. Newman spelling theorem, and it's about groups. And um, just as a reason why it's called the spelling theorem, it's got to do something with a type of groups called one-related groups. And, and there's, a, there's a class of words. You can describe things as words in there, and, and these are spelled in a certain way. 
Now, this means absolutely nothing if you don't know what a one-related group is or what a word is or what the identity element is, but it's something to do with spelling. This, this, this name spelling theorem doesn't come from nowhere. But there is something everyone staring at this screen right now. I mean, it is, it's, it's quite a peculiar looking slide um, with this sort of strange looking text in the middle. But no matter whether you replied or, or, or pure or whether you're a first year or a last year or anything, um, there is something you can look at this and ask yourself a reasonable question about. And that is um, about sort of the, the most fundamental component of the B.B. Newman spelling theorem, the, the sort of the reason, the, 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 the absolutely key thing about the B.B. Newman spelling theorem. And that's B.B. Newman. And that's really what this talk is going to be about. Um, and I myself first heard about this theorem about two years ago. And in early 2019, I asked myself the question, well, who was B.B. Newman? Um, and what did this original 1968 proof um, look like? And this, this, uh, this led to, to quite a long sequence of events. And so I'd like to start with, with here's a, a picture of, um, of absolutely, it's not B.B. Newman at all. It's someone completely different. Uh, in fact, this is uh, probably the most famous mathematician who's ever lived. Um, uh, yes, yeah, certainly, I would say the most famous mathematician to ever live. Um, and his name, uh, oh, hang on, and his name was Charles Dodgson. This is, um, and, and he, he did a lot of work in uh, linear algebra. Now, he wasn't particularly famous for his linear algebra results. In fact, there's only a small lemma called Dodgen's lemma, and he didn't do much maths at all, but he was a mathematician. What he was more famous for was his stories about going down the rabbit hole, which I think is quite apt for this entire story. And he wrote this story about chasing a white rabbit down the rabbit hole um, under a pen name of Lewis Carroll. And he, uh, and I think that's a, a, a pretty good metaphor for the story you're about to hear. So without further ado, let's get started. So to start with my hunt, I decided to look in all the standard references about combinatorial group theory. Um, there's two books called Combinatorial Group Theory, and both of them are very good for this sort of stuff. So the, looking at, at the first one, you see a statement of this, this theorem, and it's attributing something to B.B. Newman, and that a proof by some people called McCall and Shipp is given below. And, and, and looking at that reference, you see some statement of this, uh, of uh, some spelling theorem of a Newman. But these people don't claim that their proof is how B.B. Newman originally proved it. And so I found this a bit unsatisfactory, and so I went to this. There's a reference six, you can see. Um, and so I looked in the reference list, and there's two references. Um, the first one says, well, it's a bulletin article in the Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society. And the second one is um, a PhD thesis from the University of Queensland, which is in Australia, from 1968. Now, unfortunately, the first one isn't informative at all. It doesn't contain any proofs. It just says that proofs will be provided at a later date. And um, so I decided to turn to the PhD thesis instead. And since it says which university it was at, I thought, well, hang on, why not just write to the University of Queensland? And that's what I do. I say, um, dear University of Queensland, um, who is B.B. Newman? Um, and, and regards, so CF, that's, that's me. Um, and they respond quite quickly, actually. They say, hi, CF. Um, we found, and I realized that this phrasing was very unfortunate, but we found Bill Beta Newman, born in 1936 in the archives. Now, just to be clear, they didn't actually find Bill hiding down in the archives. They found a reference to Bill Beta Newman in their archives, and that he did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in mathematics at the University of Queensland. They even found his master's thesis, um, old as it is but there were no records of him ever doing a PhD at the University of Queensland. And of course, regards, as always, University of Queensland. And this was quite peculiar because um, most universities are very proud, well, I'd say hopefully every university is very proud of their PhD students and, and their PhD thesis. 
but but they did, they couldn't find it nor any record of it. Um, but they found something about its bachelor's degree and its master's degree, and this was really quite strange. And and uh, well, I didn't have anything to go on now, um, so I guess I sat down with a master's thesis and had a look at that, which was also on group theory. It was from 1964, a few years earlier. Um, and the title was almost just Metabelian groups. Oh, I. I hope, hopefully, my own thesis will have a slightly more confidence-inspiring title than almost just Metabelian groups, which is as vague as it gets. Um, but in there, he actually writes, in his acknowledgments, he writes that he thanks his supervisor, Dr. M. F. Newman, another Newman, for directing his attention to blah, blah, blah. He also acknowledges the encouragement giving, given by his wife for her help in typing this thesis. That was quite a different time um, when, when, well, you, you were assumed that it was assumed that your wife would type your thesis for you. Um, but then I thought, well, hang on. If this MF Newman, this mysterious new double initial Newman, uh, was his master supervisor, then perhaps he was also his PhD supervisor. I thought, and so I googled around for an MF Newman in Australia, and I find Professor Mike Newman at the Australian National University. I thought, well, how many of those can there be? And so I write to him. I say. Dear Mike Newman, our BB's MF regards as always CF. Uh, and he responds back quite quickly, saying, Dear Carl Frederick Nyberg Brother, very formally, I am the MF Newman you are looking for, which is probably some sort of Jedi quote, but he continues and says that he has not had any contact with Bill Newman for many years, and he doesn't even know whether he's still alive. But he knows that the real PhD supervisor of B.B. Newman was Gilbert Bamslack in New York. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I was very surprised at this statement. Um, oh, hang on. Of course, regards from Mike, first of all. But there was a couple of reasons why this last sentence uh, about the supervisor was surprising. Now, the first one is that if you've ever tried making an earth sandwich, um, if you would place one slice of bread on the ground in New York and one slice of bread in Queensland, you would basically form an Earth sandwich. That's how far apart Queensland and New York are. And the second one is that Gilbert Bamsleg is one of the most famous people in this combinatorial group theory world. And there's no records of him ever having done had anything to do with a Bill Newman. Uh, and so I, um, you know, I, I thought, well, hang on. Well, let me let me go to Gilbert Bamsleg and ask him. And and this is here is Gilbert Bamsleg in New York. Um, and a picture of him, or rather, very clearly, this is a picture of someone, some poor, probably undergraduate student or so, taking a picture of a blackboard and Gilbert Bamsleg walking into frame. But this is an official picture on Gilbert Bamsleg's webpage in, in, in City College, New York. And there's only one small problem right now um, for me contacting Gilbert Bamsleg, and that's that he passed away six years ago, which makes contact a little bit more difficult. But he did spend his entire academic career at City College, New York. New York. And because of this, I thought maybe, maybe BB did his submitted his thesis to New York, and that's why Queensland wouldn't have it. And so I decided to write to New York, saying, "Dear City College, New York, please tell me that I know who BB Newman is." Regards as well. And a few, um, quite shortly thereafter, I was at a conference. At I, I get an email. And it's not an email from City College New York, as you'd expect. Um, in fact, this email had nothing to do with City College New York at all. It's an email from Bill Newman. And so for all my efforts to track B.B. Newman down, he has managed to track me down first. Now, absolutely no idea how he found my email address. He wrote from his hotmail address, not from some official email. Uh, but I open it quite quickly just to make sure that it doesn't vanish or that I'm dreaming or something. And he starts, hi, Carl. And this is a blast from the past. I'm long since retired and now settled in the Philippines. I live by the beach and run cell EMB listings, keeping me very active. He continues his life story, and he's opened a dance studio here, teaching some of the local women cha cha, rumba, you name it. And senility affects us all in different ways, indeed. But 
he continues this life story with an actual academic story. He says that he didn't do the at the main campus of the University of Queensland, like expected. See, he was based in a small city, roughly the size of Norwich, in Townsville, a thousand miles away from the main campus in Queensland, at James Cook College. Now, Townsville is quite funny. It's quite a name for a, for a town or a city. And it's even more funny when you, when you realize that the, the founder of the city was called Robert Towns and really wanted the city to be called Townstown. But some really boring people decided that that would be a little bit too silly. So they may, went for Townsville. In any case, at the end of his PhD, this college that he built, based that, became its own university. And so BB was given the choice, graduate from Queensland or graduate from James Cook University. And he chose the latter. It means that James Cook University should have the best distance. And so, after thanking him for this email, I write desperately, James Cook University, please, please tell me that you have BB Newton's thesis. And I, I tell them, I've got this story. Just tell me you have this thesis. I don't even have to, I don't want to write out the entire story for you guys. Just tell me you have it. But regards is always CF. Um, and I get an email back, dear CF, we have it, regards James Cook University. And so after some hoops to jump through of filling in old copyright forms and, and, and the like, I get a scanned copy of B.B. Newman's thesis in my email a few days later, some aspects of one related groups, um, and in there, in section 2.1, you find a spelling theorem, and it's the original proof is there. It's very different from the proof given in the, in the sort of more modern treatments. And the hunt was finally over. But it didn't quite end there. Because James Cook University wrote to me a while later, a couple of weeks later, saying, Dear CF, so this was in, um, this was about a year ago. And they wrote, CF, could you send us the full story? Because our 50th anniversary is coming up in April 2020. And B.B. Newman was one of our first PhD graduates. That's very interesting for our anniversary celebrations. So we would like you and Bill to attend these celebrations. Because, of course, there's no way some weird global pandemic would happen that would stop these sort of celebrations and leave me stuck in the UK. Regards, as always, James Cookie. And so unfortunately, I didn't end up going this April. Uh, but likely, it's just been postponed to next year or the year after or something like that. And hopefully, I'll be able to be part in celebrating the 52nd anniversary or something like that of James Cook University. Um, and, and with that, the story was, this part of the story was more or less over. Um, there was another aspect which opened up, and that was that Bill worked as a bookbinder. Um, and, and in fact, according to him, he was one of the largest book binderies north of Brisbane in Australia. But that's not saying very much, given that the only thing north of Brisbane is essentially, you know, massive kangaroo farms. Um, but he was, he was the largest book binder north of, of Brisbane. Uh, and he bound his own PhD thesis in kangaroo leather, which is not a claim a lot of people can say, especially if you're not Australian. It's the most Australian thing you could imagine. Um, and trying to hunt that copy down was a story on its own for another time. But he also, he was commissioned by the university that had just become a university, right? This James Cook University. They said, hey, we'd like, we need a visitor's book. And so we'd like to commission you to make a visitor's book. And so here is a picture of that visitor's book that B.B. Newman, the mathematician, found right at the end of his PhD. And it's, of course, this is the formal opening of a university in the Commonwealth, with, which means that um, Queen Elizabeth II was there to sign it in 1970, a considerably younger looking Queen Elizabeth, of course. Um, but here she is signing the handiwork of a mathematician. Um, and, um, and yeah, Bill himself didn't stay in academia after this. He, he decided to move on to various industry. He worked for the European Space Agency and as part of this, he worked on what's called error correcting codes, a part of, of sort of linear algebra and algebra um, for, um, 
for sending transmitting information and and so he was the the chief mathematician behind uh, what was called the Giotto project which intercepted Halley's comet in 1986 and so quite recently Bill sent me this old newspaper clipping of himself being left starry-eyed over Giotto in the local Townsville newspaper and so I thought I'd um, finish the talk on this lovely old paper clipping about Townsville mathematician Dr. Bill Newman. Uh, thank you. I'll take any questions if you have it in the chat. Feel free to. Uh, yeah, so I, I, oh, hang on. Uh, yes, I have spoken quite a bit to, to Bill. Uh, I asked him whether he would bind my thesis in kangaroo leather. Um, and he said that unfortunately he doesn't do that, that, that sort of stuff anymore. That, 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 that's in the past. <laughs> but, um, but no, so I wrote an essay on this, which you can find online. If you Google the B.B. Newman spelling theorem, it's almost like I planted you in the audience to ask that question. <laughs> it's a bit suspicious. But yeah, so I wrote an essay on this. You can find it online if you search for the B.B. Newman Spelling Theorem or my name or something like that. Um, and for that, I needed a lot of, um, of background information. So I had to write back and forth to him. And there's some really uh, interesting anecdotes that he, he shared. And he, he's, he's quite a peculiar man, as you can imagine. Um, he sent me a YouTube video of surfing at, at, uh, at the Airbnbs he runs. And, um, and so I've seen his house now, apparently. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Leanne. Yeah, that looks like the link. Oh, geez, lots of questions. Theodore Simpson, 1002887555, number two. How long did it take you to get the first email from him from when you first started hunt? It's a good question. Something like a month. So not very long uh, in terms of actual um, of actual time, but some, something like something like a month. And then Mike Arnold says. Do you know of anyone else who had tried to drag down the original proof? That's a good question. Almost like a plenty of you too. Yeah, so I got, I heard back when I put this online, I heard from a bunch of mathematicians who's in this area and they, they wrote, they, they really liked the story. And um, a couple uh, of people said that they had tried to track this story down. Uh, one guy called Charles Gardham in Oxford and, and um, uh, someone up in Glasgow who I forgot who it was. But anyway, they, they had tried finding it, but they didn't get quite as far. Uh, I guess they weren't as uh, stubborn to find this 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 silly thesis. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and 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 Theodore Simpson, one zero two eight eight seven five five number two. Any further questions? Uh, and thank you, Liam Gray, um, for posting that that archive. So you can find that the story in there. There's some actual maths in there as well, but but the la the last section contains the story itself. Okay, so thank you, Carl Frederick, for that. That was really interesting. And I think that's quite an unusual talk to receive in sort of mathematical context, because often everyone's just concerned with the maths and not the people behind it. So that's really interesting to hear about. Um, up next, we've got Jared. So I'll give Jared a minute to prepare his slides and then he can get ready whenever he's, or he can get started whenever he's ready. So over to you, Jared. Ah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Carl. I'll, I'll be reeling from that for quite some time. That was rather interesting. Oh, I, I do, I do love work, but it's the, it's the fit of the chase. <laughs> so just, I just need to see if I can. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Uh, share. Hey, <laughs> excellent. I'm not a lecturer yet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, actually, first, can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> I've could have been talking for myself for quite some time. <laughs> and now, can you all see me? Fabulous, right? Let's get uh, let's get going. It's gonna be a very different kind of thought because um, I didn't have to track down anybody. So, 
Unfortunately, it was, it was just a classic style project. So this is the project I did last year, and I would have done a presentation in front of people, but there was there was something about a pandemic which uh, prevented that aspect of it. But so it's nice now to be able to deliver this in a slightly different context. So I've modified it a little bit to suit it, and so I've got a little bit more time just to go through some stuff. So I think it'll be rather interesting. So. I did my project on the oceanic thermohaline circulation. Uh, it was supervised by David Stevens. And this is the uh, finished article. 18 pages, exactly, of what lovely mathematics. And it, and it would have, I would have delivered this back in March, but that was November. But I could, I've just been looking this up. I'm just making sure I haven't forgotten the cool stuff. So. Yay. So a good question would be, uh, what is thermohaline circulation? It is the component of general oceanic circulation controlled by horizontal differences in temperature, and that's where we get thermo from and salinity, which is the halon from. And for about the top 400 meters of the ocean, about, um, current is driven by wind from primarily, and it's superimposed on this oceanic thermohaline circulation. And well, it does water uh, at depth, which is cooler and less salty, replaces the more the warmer, saltier, at the, the, the more surface of the ocean, as you can imagine, um, particularly from equatorial regions, thanks to precipitate, thanks to um, evaporation. Uh, the water evaporates, leaving more salt. It moves up, then the more salty water is forced down, and it's forced under the ocean, and then it finds a place in the world where it can rise back up again. So, and it completes the loop. And this process is slow. It's of the order about, uh, usually about like a centimeter a second, in fact, that's how slow it is. And it transports not just heat, though, it's nutrients and solids and other materials. And it drives warmer surface water polewards from the subtropics, which moderates the climate of Iceland and other coastal areas of Europe. And as this walk, despite my interest, I knew a little bit about, well, the Gulf Stream, uh, but I wanted to know more about the mathematics behind it. And is there a nice way of modeling something which isn't a horrendous set of PDEs, which would take days to solve? And, and there is, in fact, and we'll go in, we'll get into that. But first, I'm going to show you a schematic of thermohaline circulation. Not to be taken literally, it's just a schematic. But as you can see here, uh, the red arrows are more warm and the blue arrows are cooler. So as you can see down the, the Atlantic Ocean, you see how the warm water passes by uh, Western Europe. And then the heat that's released into the air. And because where we are, we often have, we are predominantly have southwesterly winds. Uh, the heat is then warm, is then moved in our direction. So if you've got southwesterly wind, that's why uh, you get milder temperatures, particularly in winter. So why is this project? Why is this project interesting? Well. With records amount of ice melt being recorded at the poles, in fact, Antarctica had its warmest temperature this year, 18.3. Things are changing all the time though. Uh, this is back when I did it in March. And so that means that there's a balance of fresh and salt water and it will change. And some scientists believe that the circulation could shut down as, as a result, but that's a bit extreme. Uh, if you do some experiments with modern climate models, it will suggest that it's unlikely and potentially a weakening would occur. And a weakening that could occur could not necessarily reduce the temperature dramatically, but it might offset the effect of the warming caused by climate change. So, uh, so naturally, we we'll, we want to be able to model the way that temperature and salinity vary. And it's exactly what I did in this project. If, if we go back to a very influential paper, back in 1961, Henry Stommel developed a two box model to represent thermohaline circulation. 
Uh, it's very influential. When you're doing, when I did a lot of research into papers, um, this one by Stommel was almost always referenced at some point. And the way this model works, and I'll show you this in the next slide as a, as a picture, but it, we've got two well mixed boxes, as in well mixed uh, salt and fresh water, and they have uniform temperatures. And they say T1 for box one, T2 for box two, and then S1 and S2 as well for the salinities. And we'll say that box one represents seawater in polar oceans, cooler as the, and then you've got box two, which represents equatorial oceans. And we're going to model this having a capillary tube at the bottom to model the flow, the circulation between the two sets of oceans. So not a realistic model, but it is a model that can help us see how salinity and temperature vary in the oceans. This is the picture that I drew of it. This is, and so you've got box one, box two. We have to, uh, the, the stirrers to represent the well mixing in the kind of experimental situation. You'll see there's a, a capillary tube and a psi. And psi is circulation itself, somehow in circulation. And we'll get to an expression to that in a bit. The overflow is to ensure that the amount of water in each box is always the same. As soon as water leaves one, it is replaced by the other. We also have these uh, permeable balls, uh, and then the infinite reservoirs at either side. Infinite, just to help us with the mathematical modeling. And T star and S star represent salinity and temperature of the atmosphere, essentially. This is just an experimental model of what happens in the oceans. Now, some assumptions. The flow, we assume that the flow for the capillary is hydrostatic. The velocity for each parcel of fluid is constant at the time. This means that the, and that also means that the flow along the capillary tube is proportional to the density differences between the two boxes. So in mathematical terms, we've got the circulation proportional to the difference. But as you know, we can write that another way. We can just say it's equal to a constant times it. Call a constant A. We won't, we won't worry about that so far because it's going to be absorbed later on into a different constant. So, <clears throat> heat and salt are transferred into and out of the boxes as represented by simple linear laws. And, and what it boils down to are these four prognostic differential equations, as in they are as in they are time dependent for S1 and S2. And we'll see some, some cross dependency, so they are linked, and also you can see the terms for the reservoirs. And C and D are just dimensional positive constants, and they have dimension of a well, rate, so one at a time. So now we've got that, we're going to want to, want to non dimensional not to non-dimensionalize our equations. And also to, as we've got a four-dimensional system, it's not very nice to work with. If we can reduce it down to a two-dimensional system, we will have, better, we have a better chance of getting some useful information out of it. So we'll define T hat and S hat like this. So T hat is just the difference between the temperature in two boxes divided by two times T star, which is our set temperature in the atmosphere. So we've got S hat, which is the difference between the salinities in box one and box, box two. The two helps just because uh, uh, we've got two different terms, it just keeps, keeps it average, it? Now we, want, now we can non dimensionalize time by tor. It's just C, as we saw earlier, which is one over time times time time, so it has no dimensions. But it's still very, but as it's just proportional to time, as Time increases or increases, so we, it's still useful. So now we get this. It's a two-dimensional system of prognostic equations with TNS, and we also have uh, phi there instead of psi. Uh, phi we define as two psi over C, 
and we've got three parameters now which determine the behavior of the system. So we've got gamma, delta, and mu. And beta s is what we define as the uh, haline correction coefficient, and BT, uh, beta t is the thermal expansion coefficient. But for the purposes of this, we can now, when we're playing around with this, we, we can just set gamma, delta, and mu. So that tidies things up a bit. Well, that's the way I did it. So now, the, a net, the natural step would be, what are the steady solutions to this? Now, for those who have done differential equations module, uh, for a second year one, when you do analytical systems, this will be the same approach. So in this case, we just set our time or in case four derivatives, which were equations seven and eight, to zero, which then changes two differential equations to two algebraic equations, even simpler to deal with. So the approach I took, as you can see from 11a, if you rearrange it, make t have the subject, you've got it in terms of phi. Similarly, you can get s hat in terms of phi. Then if we substitute it into our expression for the circulation, or the non-dimensionalized circulation, we get this. So you tidy it up a little bit, and the punchline for this is a cubic, cubic equation for phi, for phi, 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 oh, why did I call them that? Phi, <laughs> capital phi. What's useful about this? A cubic equation is something that we can solve and we'll, we can get values for, uh, for phi. And once we've got values for phi, we can substitute them into our expressions for T and S. And there you have it. You have the steady states for salinity and temperature. But, actually, but you may well notice on here, it's not quite as straightforward because we have a modulus of phi there. But one way we can work around that is by simply using the definition of the modulus. So, so you can make that positive if phi is greater than zero or negative when phi is less than zero. So you get two different cases. Then you, then you can solve it, uh, I use maple. And the good thing about it is in this case, if it's, very, it's very easy to solve the cubic equation uh, for the computer. Or you can solve it exactly if you want, but um, in, this, in this instance, that's just not going to get us anywhere. <laughs> so the numerics are fine for this. So let's, let's get to a particular example. As I said earlier, we have some parameters. I'm going to set them to be realistic values. The so delta is 1 6, gamma 5, 5, and mu 3 over 2. So if we go through the process, it actually is quite an interesting and I thought rather fun process of solving it and remembering that, for example, uh, what you need to consider is if you're assuming that phi is greater than zero, you're going to have to ignore any solutions that you might get from the cubic, which aren't. So doing all that, I got these. So, so and these steady solutions, which I call T hat and S hat. You've got these lovely decibel numbers. And then what you can do is that you can classify them. Now, classifying these equations particularly because they aren't that, they're non linear and they're not very nice to do so because there are some methods of calculating these things. However, in the paper, there, there are these things called Boncari conditions. And by using them and uh, taking every single look, all the cases, very carefully and manipulating our parameters in such a way we get something to learn for, which was a work, which was some work in itself. Again, I find that rather well, that was, that was rather pleasing to be fair. We classified we have these uh, steady states. So we have a stable node, a saddle point, and a stable spiral. So now, but of course, our calculator does that does that match up to what we get if we plot the phase portraits? And that's always the fun bit. So let's take a look at the phase portrait. So what I've done here, I've taken the wider phase portrait and zoomed in on a couple of areas just so you can get the bigger picture. So for our picture A, it shows the stable node as a black point. So, so as you can see, if you follow the arrows, we, I've also plotted a trajectory. It goes in, you can see the arrows, the direction that they are, and it goes into the node. So, so if you start here, it goes in, 
goes here. So it tracks, it's like a sink, for example. And, and then in picture B, we have our saddle point. As you can see, uh, the arrows sort of tell by the point. And then, rather pleasingly, the spirals, which acts as like a whirlpool. So you start at one point in the blue, you'll, you'll get pulled in. But then you might start to wonder, well, how that affect the solution? Because this is T against S. So if it's a spiral, you may well realize that you might expect some, uh, some sort of oscillatory behavior in the solution, the, the time-dependent solution. So, but, you, but also as it's a stable spiral, the amplitude will decrease and eventually will, will, will stabilize to the steady state. You can also set parameters such that uh, you get unsteady state. Um, but it's not so easy to see. So the unsteady solutions. So this was the re this was the really good bit of the project because you know I have all this stuff. You know I've got the equations, but can I get them? Can I get them to work in <laughs> such that it kind of agrees with some stuff that's in written literature? And thank this. Yes, he did. I managed to program Maple to solve the two-dimensional system, which is not, not very nice as it has modulus, so it's moduli. But if you do so, if you, you can now plot the um, very initial conditions. If we start at this to say zero, zero, you can see it approaches the stable node for TNS. However, if we start at a different point, this, this, this is the effect of uh, varying initial conditions. They tend to the spiral instead, and as you can see, there's slight oscillatory behavior before it finally tends to the solution. So now we've done a lot with the two box model, you may wonder, okay, what else can you do with this? Was, well, there are many different routes and ocean dynamics is a very vast topic. And in fact, I've not done the dynamical oceanography yet, but as soon as we do, as soon as I do, you will uh, hopefully learn more about general circulation. But for now, there is a free box model one can adopt, which I also did. It's a bit more complicated, but it was quite a fun extension. It's not too similar from the processes, but you do end up with six, a six dimensional equation, which I boiled down to four, a bit of work. And then I managed to solve that one too, uh, just numerically, which was, which was also rather pleasing. But you can then just start to consider how modeling, uh, the fact that then the hairline circulation is used in more modern research. And also there are, different ways of modeling these things as well. For example, up down here we have, we can do, is a loop model instead of a box model, which is actually rather interesting. So, <clears throat> there's, there's also one other different type of equation. I want to mention something. Is, that's it. There is a stochastic differential equation uh, set that it can be used to formulate this problem. I didn't go in that direction, but as you can see, there, was, there are many different kinds of mathematics which can model this, but they all really stemmed from the 1961 work that Henry Stommel did. So getting to grips with some of this mathematics first is a good starting point. Particularly, it's only had 18 pages to go, but it can, it can be expanded to many areas, which I think is really interesting. It would be interesting to uh, be more about it, but... I did feel we got we got uh, we got we got quite got our teeth stuck into some nice mathematics. Ah, so uh, thank you uh, for listening to my rambling and <laughs> discussions on uh, the haline circulation. And believe me, this uh, I've, I've mentioned it so many times over here. I'm never going to forget it. <laughs> but I had a bit of be like, don't ever mention oceanic the haline circulation. <laughs> Uh, that was, oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's, it's a bit weird, you know, because um, well, well, 
I'm technically talking to myself, but I'm not. Sometimes it's easy to forget that you're actually listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't you know? Um, it's, always, it's even weirder when I was doing bingo because I was literally just saying numbers for no reason. It was just kind of like, what am I doing with my life? Anyway, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much um, for playing the question. This is my project. Also, if you're interested in the project more, it is available. It's, it's publicly available on my LinkedIn profile. But it's only 18 pages. It just goes through some nice mathematics. It arises if and puts it in context of oceanic, uh, oceanic, oceanic circulation. I think the professor, the teachers, he's a good person to talk to. And if you're doing the oceanic module, which I'm also doing next semester, it would be very interesting to see what that has to offer. So I'm going to pass back over to our President Shea and to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to finally the presentation, the treatment that it deserved, is all just lying in my safe box all this time. Thank you, Jared. That was a really good presentation. Um, so that's all we have for you today. Um, thank you very much again to Jared and Carl Frederick for some great presentations there. Um, as always, thank you for attending. Um, I think at most we had 20 people in, which was that's amazing. I think we only had about Sort of five or six at the last open lecture so that's a brilliant turnout and we're really happy with that um so thank you again to the speakers thank you to everyone who's come along to um attend to, to watch and listen um and we'll hopefully see you again in our next open lecture which is to take place um sort of around march time so that's prime time for students doing their projects or dissertations to present so we really look forward to that so thank you everyone for attending bye bye